All right, so a disclaimer. I'm going to start right out with this. What I'm presenting to you really is unpublished proprietary data provided by the researchers and the company. Hasn't yet been peer reviewed, hasn't yet been published. In fact, I've never seen it before being asked to prep for this. So, so really, I'm not arguing pro. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the data and give you something to think about. This is what's coming down the pipe. Hopefully, this is something that does become a reality. Certainly, any test that predicts response to chemotherapy is a good thing. But having said that, again, I don't have access to the raw data. I don't have access to the background. So whether you like it or not, look at this as a sneak peek into where we hope the field is going. All right. So we know that patient response to chemotherapy is variable. It's difficult to predict. As you saw, uh, you know, the, the response rates from chemotherapy, for example, in bladder are somewhat disappointing. And the fact of the matter is that with most chemotherapies, we talk about response rates, maybe 20, 30, maybe 50%. Rarely do we get more than that. So there is a strong motivation across all cancer types, not just prostate cancer or bladder cancer or GU cancers, but across all cancers, we would love to have the biomarkers that predict for response. The fact of the matter is we don't have biomarkers for many cancer drugs at all. Most of them we're using more generally and broadly without a biomarker. And yet, one would think that there is a way to profile a tumor to say, what is the gene expression? What is the protein expression? You know, certain tumors that are dependent on certain pathways ought to be more responsive to certain chemotherapeutics than others. Certainly, I mean, it makes perfect sense, but it's been difficult to come up with that. So, Decipher's come up with this test, looking at RNA expression. You know, the attraction of RNA expression, of course, is that RNA expression should then be translated into protein expression. The reason we don't see proteomic assays is because proteomics is still it's a fairly nascent field, hard to actually do, hard to do in real time especially. So RNA is the closest we could get to talking about actual protein expression in a tumor. And we know against this background that you know, chemotherapy has had a resurgence in prostate cancer care from the stampede data, from the latitude data, from RTOG 531 and 621. Hopefully we're past the age where there was nihilism about the use of chemotherapy in prostate cancer. It has a major role to play. So the question hopefully is then how do you pick out the patients who are going to benefit most? All right. Is there a molecular signature? That's what this talk is about. So, of course, we always start with cell line studies, and there's, there's multiple cell lines out there that we can test against. And there are multiple ways in which drug sensitivity is tested uh, against cell line panels. I mean, there's gel matrices, there's 3D modeling. There are commercially available compound or uh, cell lines available. And so what Decipher did here is they looked at RNA expression data from these cell lines and tried to correlate it with drug sensitivity data initially, so this was data mining. And then they moved on to actually doing assays. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, okay, if anybody's good at math, you can explain this to me. I'm well past this, although I think my son very soon will be trying to explain these things to me or asking him to help, so I need to study. So what they ultimately did was they develop what they call this drug score, okay? So you have this coefficient of relative expression of this list of genes, right? This, these RNA assays. I don't know what these straight lines mean anymore. Boy, it's been a long time. But in any sense, you know, what they're talking about is a numerical score, okay? To talk about does the patient's tumor express the sensitivity expressed by the cell lines, does that translate over into what's seen in actual patients uh, to say, will you respond to docetaxel or not? In general, the higher score saying higher sensitivity for a drug gene pair. They ended up looking in, retros in, uh, in available tissue banks, 15,000 radical prostatectomy patients, and 900 of those patients uh, with, with treatment looked at their long-term outcomes and then compared that to data derived from 20 cancer cell lines and developed these scores, as we were just looking at, to say, can they predict for the response to chemotherapy? All right, so what you get 
is graphs like this. This is a bit easier to read, right, for the, the person who's mathematically challenged. So what you end up seeing is a difference, a separation between the cisplatin sensitive or drug sensitive versus drug resistant population, in this case for cisplatin. Over here, same thing for paclitaxel, right? And you see a bit more separation on the platinum side than you see for paclitaxel. Over here, we're talking about bladder cancer cell lines. Over here, we're talking about breast cancer cell lines. But this is how these, these scores are generally calculated. And what they then went on to do is to look at different drugs with these cell lines, deriving this data, and trying to find, is there a statistically significant separation? In bladder cancer, they said yes with cisplatin, no with paclitaxel. Down here with breast, you see positive uh, scores with some of these data sets in paclitaxel, but negative with others. But then we get this. So looking at paclitaxel, one would hypothesize, right, mechanistically, an antimicrotubule drug should be correlated with tumor cell proliferation, right, microtubule assembly being important during the mitotic process. And you do see a positive correlation here, right, nice and tightly bound. Correlation coefficient 0.75, which is very encouraging. With olaparib, this is correlating the response to olaparib, so this is a PARP inhibitor with the uh, expression of DNA repair genes, right? So absence of DNA repair genes should say that a PARP inhibitor should be efficacious. We'll go into this more tomorrow when we talk about uh, the use of uh, genomic signatures and the treatment of prostate cancer. But here we expect a negative correlation, and indeed it's seen. And so this is the type of score you're trying to develop for prostate cancer for response to chemotherapy. So this is the prostate cancer data looking at various drugs, you know, that have been tested at different times in prostate cancer, very traditional drugs, docetaxel, paclitaxel, estramustine, kind of all familiar over many years. And what is encouraging in this is that you know, where we see red circles should be a negative correlation, blue is positive. The blue and the red at least line up theoretically with the mechanism of action of the drugs. So we would expect that for docetaxel, you'd see this, uh, you'd see positive correlation down here, you know, here cell cycle regulation. So again, having to do with uh, the rate of proliferation. Coagulation, what that would have to do with docetaxel, I have no idea, so the fact that it's negative is probably a positive thing, right? And you see that these do sort, at least in an encouraging way, such that to say that for taxanes, you have correlation with cell cycle, with proliferation, with DNA repair. With alkylating agents, you have a negative correlation with, with, uh, with AR, a positive correlation with neuroendocrine subtype. This reflects how we actually use these drugs in clinical practice with PARP inhibitor and pardon the typo there, correlation with basal subtype because as we have begun to understand this from TCGA data, there's a correlation between the presence of the, uh, the DNA repair gene defects and, and basal subtypes. All right, and ultimately, you know, this is where the, the data is supposed to come together. So this is a heat map of the 15,000 radical prostatectomy patients. So what you see, up on the top here is the various uh, categories or, say, subtypes of prostate cancer. So those patients with ETS fusions, basal-like versus luminal, low AR activity versus high, radiation sensitivity as we understand it. And what you see down here is a heat map with the various drugs. And what you end up seeing is that these cluster according to then the pattern of gene defects. So this is overexpression, underexpression, activity, high, low. And you see clustering for basalness, for AR activity, for radiation sensitivity, and that the chemotherapies end up clustering by drug module. I mean, this is the kind of result when we look at drug sensitivity assays and other cancers, this is what we expect to see to say, all right, if you've got the clustering, you've got a signal. The question is, can you translate that signal into a test that can be run in real time? And is that signal powerful enough to then lead to actual differences in clinical outcomes? So where this stands is the very early, early preclinical data looks promising. Things are clustering the way we want them to. Perhaps there is going to be applicability. What we don't have yet, 
and further validation is very necessary. What we don't have yet is application of this to a prospective randomized clinical trial. Really, that's where this has to go. You know, at the Mayo Clinic, we're very familiar with this. One of my mentors in, in breast cancer had a very exciting assay for a prediction, the pharmacogenomic prediction of tamoxifen efficacy. Everyone was convinced it was going to work in two ra large randomized clinical trials. I mean, it, it, it failed abjectly to the shock of, you know, the assembled people at the conference at the time. So we need further validation. We need that prospective clinical trial. But nevertheless, nevertheless, this is the kind of data that makes us say we need to move forward with this and look at it. Um, these groups were distinguishable, which they ought to be, by AR activity, by basal versus luminal subtype. And the sensitivity profiles were at least consistent, theoretically, with what you'd expect for the chemotherapy. So I'd say in the pro sense, the technology is certainly a step in the right direction to improve treatment outcomes. Certainly exciting data. We look forward to seeing this released publicly and, and hopefully, uh, you know, parsed out and tested further.